Hello and welcome to the Transfers Podcast, powered by footballtransfers.com, a new podcast where we bring in news, insight and analysis on that most important of the least important things, football. I'm Roland Murphy and I'm joined today by Paul MacDonald. I'm delighted to have Paul back on the show. It's it's great to have Paul back to talk about uh, the transfers of the summer, how they've got on at their, their new clubs, how each club has done in the transfer market. We're going to give everyone a kind of a, a grade and a report card of the, the transfers this month. So it's uh, it's good to have you back, Paul. Welcome back. Good afternoon, Ronan. So uh, I suppose that the best way to get into uh, grading the transfer window is looking at the uh, Premier League. So the the big spenders obviously were Chelsea, as yeah, so always. So. I know you uh, don't think too highly of their transfer window. Well, Chelsea, I think, are actually doing a little better under Maresca than, than people expected, but it's it's largely the players that were there for uh, last season or even longer that are the ones that are performing for them. Uh, Jackson's turned into a football player. Um, Palmer has kind of extended his form from last season. Um, Fernandez has stepped up a bit, so has Caicedo. They look, they look like a more settled team, but as far as the guys that they signed this summer go, like hardly any of them really are, are involved in that regular basis. Like Neto, sixty million from um, from Wolves, kind of slots in every now and again off the bench, but just for fleeting cameos. The same with Jao Felix, who does very similar twenty minutes here, twenty five minutes there. Dewsbury Hall, I don't think has played at all yet. Um, Jorgensen, the goalkeeper, I don't think he's featured maybe in a squad. And then you've got. Absolute fringe guys like Kellyman, uh, Gio, Vega and Al Semino, which basically haven't been seen. It's difficult to put a report card down for guys who are posted missing. But um, as far as the impact that they've had on Chelsea's team so far this season, it's, it's very minimal. And that was €238 million Euro worth of, of savings, I might add. It's not like um, £5 million here or £10 million there. Quite a lot of cash being spent on guys that are having no real discernible impact on the first team right now. So the fact that, um, that Maresca has uh, managed to get that the, the old Chelsea team or the previous Chelsea team to the the, the moderately better level than they are now um, is testament to his decision-making as a coach rather than the signings that he may or may not have asked for. Who, who, who really knows? Yeah, you have a report carding, card rating of an E and it's hard to disagree with that considering that all the key players, like you mentioned, are players that were there at the club before and they've spent nearly 250 million and we haven't seen any return on those 250 million players that they've bought and yeah it's a bit like Manchester United that they've spent over 200 million too and we're yet to see too much from some of their new entrants as well yeah I've graded them as a D but that's simply because at least these guys have been seen so we know they exist um, <laughs> the Zuxi, the Lift um, and Masrui are playing regularly although albeit you might say not particularly well I think of those three probably Masrui has settled in the best um, I think the Ligt is still kind of catching up with the pace of the league a little bit and I think the lack of kind of consistent defensive partners there uh, with Martinez picking up an injury and then obviously Lindelof's been in, Maguire's been in and obviously Lenny Yoro was supposed to be the guy who, who would slot in there but he's played the, the, grunt, the sum total like 45 minutes in pre-season and picked up that injury so we've, we've not seen him in the Premier League yet so um, D grading for these guys um, I think Zuxi has been a big disappointment so far I expected a bit more from him but then again it just seems that whenever Man United sign a player now they, they drift into that Old Trafford black hole where good players become bad overnight or become a player that doesn't look fit for the position that they're supposed to be playing in I, mean, I don't really know how you get out of that it's a, it's a difficult spiral to fall into and even the guys that have been there for a while like Rashford for example have fallen into it this season so um, I hope that you know, over time these guys can prove themselves to be worth the kind of money that, that United uh, uh, put out for them but at the moment you would say that those signings haven't discernibly improved Man United's first team and to spend that kind of money and not be any better than you were and in fact probably worse than you were um, is a, a bit of an indictment on United's transfer policy. Yeah, these are kind of players that we might see improve in the future but at the moment they haven't really changed anything at all Trafford and seems to be that the old, the old players that are there they haven't improved either and it's a lot of pressure on some players going to Old Trafford we know all about it it's kind of the biggest media window in in world football but moving to Manchester United it's very difficult for a lot of players it's hard for these young guys you're all maybe an exception but Xerxes it's a lot put on his shoulders 
to expect him to be scoring and assisting in, in a new league, a new team, and at so young, and with another forward that's also young, Highland in attack. So, Manchester United in the past maybe would have had experienced veteran to for him to learn from or to take some of the weight off his shoulders, but it's not there at the moment. And I'm not sure the coach is helping either, as Manchester United fans would definitely agree. And yeah, I, I think Man United could be in for a, a tough season before we see much from these new signings so it might take a while before that the rating maybe changes to a C or, or better but I think they're generally across the Premier League you have awarded a lot of a lot of C's and one of them is Man City but they didn't actually spend much money at all well they didn't sign many players at all this summer I think it's not been a great summer for the transfer market in general if I look down the list there's not many teams out there that you could say Certainly not among the big sides that had a real barnstorm in summer that they kind of signed a lot of guys that which markedly improved their teams. Um, I've got Man City. I see. I think I think Savino is a perfectly good sign and he and he slotted in really competently. But it's the reason it's a C in there is simply because like Guardiola's squad these days is pretty thin. And that's the way he likes it. I think he likes to trust a certain core group of players. Um, the money certainly they have to go and spend because. Uh, obviously, they sold uh, Julian Alvarez to um, to Atletico amongst uh, amongst other smaller uh, sales that they made. Um, I think their transfer balance is something in the region of plus 110 million for the summer. So they could have went and spent money if they wanted, but it's um, it just shows like that when when ever Pep gets embedded in a squad, he starts to tend to trust the group of players around him less and less, and wants to work with that core group as much as possible. I also think it didn't help City squad that obviously Oscar Bob get injured at the start of the season. I think he might have played a lot more minutes um, that had he been fit so it's, it's a middling summer from, from City but I think basically with, with everything that happened with the with the charges and all the off-field antics that's happening around the club right now I think they just decided let's just keep our powder dry this summer guys and get through this one and then we can worry about making that, a really big statement saying and potentially in 2025 if we're not playing in the, the conference league at that point <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I suppose part of that too could be the fact that they might have to pay a, a big fine. That could be the case too. So it may be hard to justify such a big outlay or an outlay on, on various players if they do have that hanging over you. So as this case goes on and, and we hear more about it, we probably will have a better idea how Man City are going to act, be active in in the transfer window or transfer windows in the future. And that will tell us more about them. But one team that were busy that you've also given a C was, was Spurs. They made the, the record signing for the Premier League and Dominic Solanke this summer, which kind of shocked everybody. That that was the biggest transfer of the summer, but that's what we got. Yeah, that's, it's worth reminding people that that was, that was the kind of summer we had, that Dominic Solanke was the was a statement signing because both you and I, Ronan, were going to do this player by player and we decided that would have been pretty boring and nobody would want to hear that. So we, we, we opted for team by team instead. And... Um, Tottenham have given a C simply because Solanke filled a need that they had and um, given the fact that they never re- replaced Kane last season, they absolutely needed a centre forward. They got one. He was expensive, but not not kind of crazy over the top expensive in, in, in as far as the modern game goes. So they, they did fulfil that need. He's not exactly at the ground running completely, but he has got, had a couple of goals and, and, and looks to be settling in reasonably well with the teammates around him. So I think that's been a good deal. And frankly, the, the other guys, you look at Odo Bear, very young. He's, he's only 19. He looks a little bit raw at this level, I've got to be honest, in the, in the games that I've saw him so far. But absolutely one of the future. The same with Bergval. He hasn't played much. Kind of fleeting cameo appearances. Again, one for the future. And I don't think Gray's been seen at all. Certainly not in a starting 11 for, for Tottenham in the, in the Premier League. So those three, again, um, guys that the kind of long-term projects for Spurs that we can't really judge yet on how good they will be. Um, because they're just not featuring enough, so we're really grading that on the kind of potential of those guys, plus the kind of the, the, the ability of Solanke to to slot into that team well. And I think they've done okay at that. I think it's it's still a lot of money, hundred nearly one hundred and fifty million euros spent, and that takes it to a total of nearly um, three hundred and ninety million euros since uh, since Ange took over just last summer. So a lot of outlay for for Tottenham. Um, but as far as this summer goes, it's, it's very much a C because we need to wait and see exactly how these guys guys perform. And on, on another level, I would say that Arsenal had a pretty solid summer. I think Calafiore really fits into Arteta's dream of playing 11 centre-backs and the one starting 11 in the Premier League at some point. Um, he looks very capable of doing that. 
And the other one is is, is Marino, Marino, which was which was really unfortunate. He got injured right at the start of the season, and then um, he's not been seen since. And if you want to include David Raya, who became a permanent signing this summer uh, after being alone last season, then I think Raya has, has proven himself to be to be one of the best goalkeepers in the league. So that kind of nudges them up. You would say probably closer to a C plus as far as Arsenal are concerned. Mourinho, we don't know yet. Fiore was a nice to have, but he's probably not in Arsenal's best starting eleven. And then obviously Raya's been, been a great signing. So maybe a little bit hard from me there, but we, we need to wait and see exactly how much of an impact Mourinho, Mourinho and uh, Calafiore can have on a regular basis. Yeah, and I think the same kind of concern is over Liverpool because they only made one signing as was <clears throat> widely spoken about in 42 million on, on, on Chiesa and we haven't got to see much from him at all. He came in injured, obviously, so that set Liverpool back, but Liverpool are obviously top of the Premier League and performing well under, under their new manager but uh, yeah they're kind of in a wait and see period for their one big sign so it's hard to give them any kind of grade this is one of these ones where you get the, the grades for player ratings in a match and it's not on long enough to rate it it's one of those I think yeah in fairness I, my spreadsheet here Mamad Dash really is supposed to be on that he's obviously not arriving to next summer but the signing was made this summer so he's he's a good 30 million of that so Kayser's only cost them 12 but he hasn't really featured much at all so far, so it's difficult to gauge where he's at in terms of being up to pace with the Premier League. But the reason I gave up with is because I think Mamad Dash really, even though he's not playing for them, I think he solves a massive problem for them going forward because Alisson is a great goalkeeper, but he's picking up the odd injury here and there now. He's also um, making some mistakes that he didn't make previously. And I think that Liverpool made the right call to go and get a goalkeeper this summer before Alisson completely regresses and there is more pressure on them on the market to find a replacement goalkeeper. I reckon if they'd have went for Mamar Dash Feeling next summer, with everyone knowing that they maybe had to definitely had to replace Alisson this summer, they might have been ch- asked to pay more for him, uh, as well as kind of Mamar Dash Feeling's brilliant performances at the Euros for, for Georgia. So I think they did the right business at the right time there for that, in, in that case. And that's why I've graded them at a C, because I think he's a good goalkeeper and I think it solves a problem for them early, rather than having to worry about it next year when, when Alisson could potentially be subject of a move or potentially looking to offload them to Saudi or, or whatever they can. Yeah, it'll probably be the last summer where they can make some money from, from Alisson if that's what they're, they're going to do and obviously that you would think that is what they're going to do because Mauer Dashvili isn't the kind of quality goalkeeper you can leave on a bench. I know, I know I've I've spoken a lot about Liverpool's goalkeeper that spends a lot of the time on the bench but Mauer Dashvili, I think, I'm sure everyone agrees agree is one of the top goalkeepers in Europe at the moment so couldn't really have him as a, a second peg to anybody at any club so it will be a huge signing for them and I have no doubt that he'll be brilliant for Liverpool going forward so yeah, the, that C that you've given in the, in the rating if he were to come and revise it in 18 months time no doubt it would probably be a, a B plus or nearly an A because that's the kind of impact that you expect someone like that to have Outside the Premier League, obviously we move on to La Liga. One of their big signings for, for La Liga was Danny Almo to Barcelona. They, they found some coins down the back of the sofa to, to buy him <laughs> and it's been, a, a, I suppose it's been a relative disaster because he hasn't been able to show what he can do after outside of the, the kind of opening of the season. Yeah, I think Barcelona seem to be one of these clubs that five years ago you would have called them quote unquote unlucky when it comes to injuries. Um, but I just don't think that's the case anymore. I think there's something underlying there. If you look at the case of Pedri, really overworked and overplayed. If you look at Gavi, similar. Um, it does seem to be a club, uh, Araujo's been out this summer, it does seem to be a club that um, attracts more injuries than others. Um, and that background, coupled with the fact that Danny Olmo, lucky if he played 20 games a season for Leipzig anyway, because he was always injured, it was <laughs> it was almost inevitable this was going to happen. Um, it was the most obvious conclusion. So... I still think he's a good player and he fits into the team well, but given that Barcelona don't have that much money to throw around anymore, buying it, spending it on a guy who unquestionably talented but will only get you probably half the minutes of it in a season um, was, was a bit of a bold move. And um, the way it's going right now, they'll be happy if he gets half the games this season because he's been he's been cropped so early. So uh, I have to really judge Barca's business on that, but I've rated it a D simply because they knew his background. They knew he was injured all the time and yet they went and signed him anyway. So, um, yeah, more fool them. Yeah, especially when they have so little money to play with and they have to do so much to activate any money to make any signings. You think they would have went for someone with 
a higher floor, a more reliable asset, perhaps. But no, they took the risk. They swung for defences and they they got struck out. I think early on, if, if I'm to continue that ba- baseball analogy, Real Madrid obviously are a team who spent massive money on a signing on fee, but not ne- not necessarily massive money in the uh, transfers spent because they had the biggest signing of the summer. We've spoken about him on, on previous episodes, but. Yeah, Kylian Mbappe, he hasn't really been lighting up La Liga the way we expected. And uh, he's even been outshone at times by a, a younger player, a younger new arrival, Hendrik, at, at, in Madrid. I, I, I still come back to the opinion that I said on the podcast before that if, um, if, if this deal hadn't been so protracted for Mbappe and if it wasn't spoken about as being a done deal for so long, I wonder if Real Madrid would still have went to get him. Now, obviously, he's a superstar. Commercially, from a marketing perspective, that really, really valuable. Unquestionably, still a good player, but you can't. You could say quite clearly that um, two things are the case right now. One, he's kind of interrupted the flow that Vinicius and Rodrigo had with Bellingham last season, particularly in the first half of last season. He's not really fit, fit in properly to the team yet, although that will probably come. And secondly, I think he's got a lot of things off the pitch which are distracting him right now and keeping his eye off the ball. Um, there's uh, the ongoing dispute with PSG being the, being the main one in terms of how much money he was owed from them when he, when he left the club. He's uh, he's now talking about not playing some of France's internationals going forward to keep himself fit for Real Madrid. Um, I'm sure that'll go down well in the place where he literally wants to win the Ballon d'Or, gives it out in France, and he, he's going to choose not to play for France. Um, I don't see that being much of a benefit of him trying to win that. Um, he's still only 25, but you, you do wonder if he's if there are a lot of miles on the clock there already and the fact he's already thinking about managing himself, is he feeling as fit as he maybe did even even two years ago? So by no stretch is it a disastrous deal. Um, but I do wonder if, if Real Madrid would have pushed through to get that done, especially when Hendrik's there. He's, uh, he looks really good, looks really talented, looks an absolute star. Um, he You could argue that he's the more natural fit in that number nine position with Rodrigo and, and uh, Vinicius either side of him. Um, but we might not see it as often as we might have done uh, if Mbappe wasn't there. And uh, Ancelotti is probably the, the, the kind of right coach for this because he allows the guys freedom to express himself within within the formations that he he lays out. But it's, it's not; it just doesn't look very fluid right now. And you would expect that, obviously, when such a high profile player comes into a team. But I don't know. I'm not. I'm just not 100 percent convinced in this one yet. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens when Mbappe's fully back from injury and gets a run in the team with this not being interrupted by, by numerous international breaks. Because that's the other thing I would mention. Like Some of these guys um, aren't getting enough time to settle into their, their, their new teams because they're away in international duty in September, October, and they're away again in November. I, I think it's the an under-discussed issue with international breaks is that these new signings, they're away from their clubs for two, two weeks of the month, for the first two months they're there. It's, it's hard for them to settle in as a result. So... Uh, um, once we, these guys actually start to hit the ground running in November, December, in, into January, we'll have a clearer indication about how, how successful these transfers have been. Yeah, because we have such a big gap in international window then between November and March. At least they have three or four full months to play for their club and they won't have the distraction, uh, for Mbappe anyway, the definite distraction of international football. So. And for players like Hendrik and some of the other South American signings, that they have to fly halfway around the world and that has to take its toll on you and we saw the, obviously what happened in the Nigerian international players during the, the international break as well and just everything that international football brings with it, with it is a distraction to club football and I know as a, as a proud Irishman I love international football but if you are a fan of these clubs and you're hoping for success from these new signings it is going to put a damper on it and you will see that through, throughout the leagues and everybody that we're kind of talking about is, for the bigger players at least, are international players so they're getting called away again and again. So, yeah, it, it's interesting to see when, how Mbappe will kind of get on once he's fit again and once he's not playing international football and once he gets a chance to play for this Real Madrid team. But I think Atletico Madrid, on the other side of the city, they made plenty of signings they spent they spent four times as much as Real Madrid this summer, but uh, you're only giving them a C as well. Yeah, I mean, I get similar to, to to Mbappe. Alvarez doesn't really seem to have fitted into the system yet. Like 
quite a lot of the time at City, he was kind of playing off Haaland. Whereas in this setup, um, he's got Griezmann to contend with alongside him, as well as playing off off of uh, Sorloth up front. It just hasn't clicked yet as as a unit. Um, they've they've been kind of very middling in, in in La Liga in terms of their results, not really setting anything to fire, and they they get an absolute hounding in the Champions League from uh, by Benfica as well. So, which at the type of result, a four 0 defeat, which you wouldn't really associate with a with a um, Simeone team. So. I think Gallagher has been a moderate success. I think he was out of the team to begin with, but he's in now, and I think the fans really like him, and I think his energy uh, will, will mean that he will, he will come good and be a valuable addition. Uh, Lane Ormond is slotted in, in at the back um, into a, 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 a defence which isn't quite as solid as maybe as it was even a couple of years ago, which is what's been more difficult for him. But yeah, like the jury's still out on that, that amount of money for, for these signings um, because... There's just there's just a, a overhanging doubt about the full Atletico project right now. Um, this is the first time that they've went on a splodge like this for quite a long time, um, and it's uh, it has to really work for them because it's a lot of money at, at that level, particularly when there's not a lot of outlay on the other side. I think they sold Felix to Chelsea, obviously, and, and Marata left for for Milan, but um, there's a lot of money and a big statement from Atletico, and if they don't at least um, look close to challenging uh, the top two, especially with with, with the top two. This season, Barcelona having the, the financial woes and, 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 and Real Madrid being really inconsistent at the start of the season. If Atletico can't keep pace with them, then um, I'm not suggesting there would be any anyone asking for Simeone to leave, but there, there would be questions raised, I think, about the, the overall the overall project at that point. Yeah, you kind of have to wonder how much to go on to back him again. If it doesn't work after spending 185 million euro, how much they can back him in future. And then that's obviously I mean, people like you said people aren't going to call for his head but they will be wondering where this money is and want to spend the money more efficiently if they are going to spend money again and it's going to be hard to trust someone who can't get the, the best out of the players that you're spending this money it's going to be hard to trust the fact that you could go out and spend another 60 million or 50 million or something like that for for an Athletic or Madrid there because it's not like it's money that they usually spend so this is a a risky season for them and it could be a long and difficult season for them and it could cast lots of doubts and question marks over the future of the, the project going forward. So let's look at the uh, the Bundesliga, Ronan, you're the, you're the man for that. Uh, the champions, Leverkusen largely managed to hold on to most of their players that, 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 that won the league the, the, the previous season um, and made a couple of new signings. Um, how have those new signings fitted in? Have they, have they played much? Have they had much impact on the first team? Uh, terrible, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, they, they not, the Martin Terrier did not have a Terrier, if it, I fought on my French accent that, that Robin has told me how to say it. He's, his debut in the, in the Super Cup wasn't the best. Then they had... Uh, another match in the league where two of the new signings got taken off at, uh, at half time so this the, the, the strongest thing for Bayer Leverkusen was to keep the team together the, the squad that won the league together to the, uh, this unbeatable Bundesliga squad but they they didn't really strengthen as much as probably they, they should have or some of the rivals could have they obviously only spent 58 million on three players in, in the summer and that is mainly because I think Bayer Leverkusen find themselves shopping in different different stores. They're a, a higher calibre of a store and a higher calibre of player that they're looking for now if they want to be a team to challenge in the, the Bundesliga, to, to win the Bundesliga again or to get to the latter stages of the Champions League. The same sort of players that they had been looking for in the past or developing in the past because we know Bayer Leverkusen like to buy young players bring them on and then they can flourish at the club before selling them. Kai Havertz is probably the, the, the best example. They got him from Cologne, rivals Cologne as a 16-year-old that brought him to the club. But uh, you have to, players like that kind of coming through, but it's harder for a team that's expected to win most games to do stuff like that because they're expected to win every game, but it hasn't been happening this season. And he even let a 2-0 lead slip against Holstein Kiel and Things like that w- would have been unheard of last season, but Leverkusen, it just hasn't worked for them. And these new signings haven't looked to improve the team. They haven't even looked to improve the squad that much so far because Zabi Alonso seems to be relying on the same players that played so many games last season and they look exhausted already this season. And 
that's why we've gone and given him a D. Yeah. And that might even be a high D. A high D. A high <laughs> D. That's a damning indictment of uh, Leverkusen's business there. Let's um, we'll get to we'll get to Bayern in a second. Let's go to Dortmund first though, because um uh, as a Scottish football fan myself, uh, as we all know, beating Celtic or Rangers seven one uh, is of no reflection of how well you're performing as a team. So leaving that result to one side, uh, how have Dortmund started the season and how have those signings, uh, guys like Max Bayer, um, Gerasi, Pascal Gross, uh, Valdemar, Anton, how have those guys impacted the, their team and, and how are Dortmund featuring uh, as a whole? Yeah, I think they, they, they look the same Dortmund that we can come to expect inconsistent, which is what fans were hoping they wouldn't be under Nuri Shaheen, who kind of took over as head coach after Eden Terzic guided them to the Champions League final. But I think they were hoping that Shaheen's kind of tactics would be better, they, that they would be more solid at the back, because defensive problems have kind of plagued them for so long. You would hope that Dortmund were better able to keep, keep clean sheets. And it looked at the start of the season that, that was what they were going to do. They kept clean sheets. In the first two games, they won matches to nil. They were they kind of looked like a team that was going to improve. And then they turned to the usual Dortmund that we come to expect that made sloppy mistakes. But we've, get, I, we've given them a C here, but I think that's because we haven't seen enough of Serhu Garassi yet. He scored a hat-trick on international break with Guinea and he, he's, he's set to start on, on Friday despite not really training too much since returning with Guinea. But he has been a, a huge difference up front for, for Dortmund. He, he looks like a man capable of carrying them and, and getting plenty of goals and being someone who can be a huge difference maker. It's just that he started the season injured. So he, it was a while before we got to see him and a lot is expected of Max Bayer, but he's only a young player. Faldemar Anton as well, he's kind of suffered from injury. So it's hard to tell like some of the teams we were talking about in the Premier League how well this will work. But if Garassi stays fit, he looks like the Garassi that they, they signed from the same player that was playing for Stuttgart last season and he can get so many goals and if he stays fit I, I wouldn't be in any doubt that maybe he could win the, the Bundesliga top scorer award ahead of Harry Kane this season because he can be a huge player on his day he is capable of leading the line for any club we've seen it already with Dortmund in a few games he's been able to play so that's the C that we've given him could easily turn into a B or a B plus as long as Garassi stays fit and firing because Dortmund are probably the be- the team one of the teams in the, the best shape to maybe challenge Bayern Munich for for the Bundesliga title even even in a better shape than Leverkusen perhaps. So let's get to Bayern then. Um, from the outside looking in, it looks to me like Olise has really settled in well and, and looks as if he's been there for a long time, but maybe less of an impact for the other signings, particularly uh, Joao Palinha, who hasn't featured much so far. I don't think. Yeah, they spent £142 million and a lot of that outlay was obviously on Elise, but a big outlay was also on Polina, who Thomas Tuchel, the New England manager, had been had been looking to sign kind of last January. It looked like that move was going to go through, then it fell apart, but Bayern Munich came and re-signed him. But in the meantime, between the, between the time Tuchel looked to sign him and Bayern Munich signed him, Pavlovic came into his own in the Bayern Munich midfield, and now they're relying on him. You've seen him play for Germany, he's playing excellently for Germany. He's seen as the, the kind of Ch- Tony Cruz successor for both Bayern Munich and Germany. So Palina, it's it's hard to see how he is going to fit into the Bayern Munich team. And it seems like money they've wasted by spending him because even in, in playing for Portugal during the international break, he kind of looked a frustrated figure. And it's easy to see why he's going to be frustrated because he can't break into the Bayern Munich team after they spent 40 million on him. They're, they're kind of left with this kind of annoyed substitute that is going to have to put the head down and he isn't really part of Vincent Company's plans at the moment whereas Elise is fit and firing and looks like a great signing unfortunately the other big signing Hiroki Ito he's been injured so he hasn't got the chance to, to play for Bayern Munich and show what he can add in defence but I think he's going to be just a squad member anyway he mightn't necessarily be a regular starter for Bayern Munich but they always need centre back cover because Bayern Munich seems to be a team that get lots of injuries in defence so yeah, he. I think he will come good and be a good squad player. But Palina is where the question marks are coming. There's no doubt. Well, at least there's no doubt about Bayern Munich scoring lots of goals because that's what they're doing. Company has been kind of praised to the hilt by the Bayern bosses, even after disappointing results or letting leads slip. Because Herbert Heiner, the president, has said that they haven't seen attracting attractive attacking football at Bayern Munich in in a long time and. You have Uli Honesty, a kind of godfather of Bayern Munich, saying that 
company has been a godsend for the club. So everybody seems to be backing company, but company isn't backing Palina at the moment. So it's hard to give them anything over a C in, in the grades. Yeah, that takes us uh, to, to Serie A and arguably a couple of the teams that have performed best in the transfer window in terms of, of the additions. Uh, we'll start with Inter, who added uh, Davide Fratesi, added uh, Peter Zelinski and Maddie Taremi, both of those guys on, on free transfers. I think what um, Simone Inzaghi has been very good at is just incrementally adding to the squad of players that he's got with just experienced players that know, that know the leagues and understand the level. I think Zelinski is a very good example of that. And uh, under, under Inzaghi, Inter just looked like a like a, just a really solid team. Um, you, you could say that potentially um, they, they do need a bit more depth uh, uh, up front, potentially, uh, uh, even though that Tanami has given them a bit of that. Maybe they, they should be scoring a, a few more goals. But um, the addition of Zielinski from nothing looks like a really, really shrewd move uh, in, the, in the midfield. And I think with that in, with that in mind, and obviously the addition of, of Fratesi, um, that looks like a really good summer's business for Inter, considering how much they spent, roughly just under £80 million, um, to get those kind of deals over the line and, and strengthen their squad in that way means they're more likely than not favourites to go and win, win Serie A once again. And uh, it'll be an interesting test to see how close they can get to the Champions League final again this season uh, after the disappointment of going out to, to Atletico last year. So uh, a good inter side. Still got the, the, star, the star men in the form of, kind of uh, Lataro Martinez. But those additions around him look, look, just look really smart um, and it looks like a really good summer's business for um, for Inter. Yeah, you've, you've given them a B and that's the first B we've handed out on the, on the show so far because the, the, none of the transfer, or none of the clubs have kind of performed that well in in the Premier League or La Liga or, or in the Bundesliga. But we've you've handed out a few Bs in the in Serie A and uh, I know our, our colleague Carlo was wanting to give Juventus an A but then I looked at the Serie A table and was like, well, you can't really give them an A. They're third in the league. So he, t- he seems to think they've done Incredible business all over there at your end. Yeah, of course he's he's in no way biased, but um, the, the B we've given them is just that they they've actually done a summer business where they solved some of the problems that they had um, and also managed to acquire an excellent coach into the bargain. So uh, Coop Miners has been influential, a superb player for uh, uh, Atalanta for a long time. Uh, Kevin Turam, Turam has been an addition that's that's really helped as well, and and Fran Concisao, um has looked like. The potential to be a real, a real superstar if they can, if they can keep him um, going forward. So those signings are really, really, really good and have actively impacted the first team. The one that's really not worked so far is is Douglas Louise, who has barely played, and he was kind of the, the, the kind of the real star signing coming from a Aston Villa. That just hasn't worked so far. So that's the kind of signing that drags the full um, report card rating down to a B. But in terms of the outlay that Juventus have spent, I think they've, they've strengthened in the one area of the pitch where they really needed to, which was in the centre of the pitch and um, I think they, they are better equipped now under a, a really good coach in Thiago Mota to go and challenge Inter properly for the, for the league than they have been in, in, in quite some time. Yeah, I, I think they, they will learn. It's going to be interesting to see can the event as a all kind of come back because this seems to be a, the right kind of rebuild that we've seen and things that have worked with the majority of the signings so far and it's easy to see why you would give them a, a B and not necessarily an A like Carlo, but a B. But yeah, I think Napoli have done similar and you were obviously very eager to keep an eye on how Scott McTominay is doing over there. And I think Man United fans are, disgruntled Man United fans are also keeping an eye on how he's doing over there because he, he seems to hit the ground running in Syria. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm in no way biased, but seeing two, two Scotsmen go out there and, and, and do really well, particularly McTominay so far, who's really... Um, has became a kind of a cult hero for the for the Napoli fans already in such, in such a short space of time, which is really good to see. He's really playing with the shackles off um, at, at Napoli the same way that he plays for Scotland. I think he's better as an attacking player uh, further up the pitch. Obviously, at, at United, Ten Hag preferred him to play um, some of the time and as one of the two holding midfielders. Um, I think his his best skill set is playing further up the pitch as as, as an attacking number ten um, to, to help assist forwards, and that's worked really well for Napoli so far. The other things they've made, Gilmore, very metronomic, good at keeping the ball. Lukaku, not amazing so far, but like you know that having playing with Conte, he's, there's a good chance that he'll get the best out of him. Uh, Buongiorno, 
very good solid signing and, and, and David Neres has been around the block a little bit but has, has always got a spark in him to go and do, do good things the Napoli have started the season well in that regard and then um, the only blot on their copybook is the fact that they, could, they couldn't really get rid of Osimhen, um as they wanted to I think the, the transfer market that they wanted to operate in with Osimhen had had gone by that point and I think that they had the fact that he's only on loan in Turkey rather than been sold for a substantial sum, which could have covered some of their 150 million outlay this summer. I think that's something that they have to worry about. Do, will they need to sell any one of these guys if, if they become really good in order to balance the books? Um, if they can get rid of Ossiman for any decent fee, which looks like that might be the case now. So um, yeah, that's that's been frustrating for them. But it was it was bold of Napoli to go and spend the money anyway, rather than waiting for the Ossiman money to to not come in. They could, could quite easily have decided. To, um, to not spend it, uh, I think Antonio Conte would have lost his mind if that had happened. But um, the fact that they did go and spend it shows that there is a bit of ambition there to go and challenge and get back that league title of theirs um, from Inter. And again, I, I think Inter Juventus and Napoli may well be the the top three. Um, Milan, on the other hand, I think they just look the, the, the kind of sign is just look weak. I mean, Fafana in midfield, the, the jury the jury's out on that. We'll, we'll, we'll wait to see how that pans out. Pavlovich is starting to play now in, in defence. Uh, Emerson Royale, I have never been a fan of him at any point of his career, really. I, I think he's always uh, open to making a mistake. I think he started his career in Milan pretty badly, although it, it has got better the last couple of weeks. I think at the beginning it was really kind of, why have we signed this guy? Uh, and then Morata, again, Morata, a guy who's really quite a sensitive footballer. Um, he needs a bit of TLC, a bit of love from uh, the, the club that he's playing for in order to really excel. And I wonder if he'll get that in, in Italy, where the pressure is really on. And then Abraham, who had a good spell at, at, at Roma initially, but again, has, he's been hurt with injuries quite a lot as well. So we don't really know his physical situation right now either. So it's very difficult to say that any of those guys that Milan have brought in, they only, they only spent 70 million, so a good chunk less than what Napoli and Juventus spent. But um, it's hard to really say that any of those guys have made, uh, at this point anyway, a gigantic impact on 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 the land starting eleven. Yeah, they, you're going to have to wait and see. Do any of them do anything? But so far, the evidence is that they're not really going to do anything. And Inter, with a similar amount of outlay, have done a hugely better job, and that's kind of shown. in when you look at the table, that's the table doesn't lie <laughs> at the end of the day. It's the, the teams who make the make the best signings, who play the best football, end up winning the league. So yeah. Except on maybe in 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 France, of course, if PSG usually end up winning the league, no matter what kind of grade we give to the, their transfer window, I think they're going to probably end up winning the league. So, how was their transfer window? Yeah, it's a surprise to see PSG not top of of the league in France. They've won five matches and drawn two so far, with Monaco out in front. But it's difficult to question the fact that they do look like a more all rounded team now than than maybe they have maybe uh, in this entire PSG project. Uh, with the Luis Enrique in charge, looking at youth, um, picking up very highly rated young players in the form of William Paccio, who came from Frankfurt, and, and obviously João Neves, who's, who's been another present in the team this season. At, at 20 years old, he looks like the future um, for, for them and for Portugal. And they've also brought in um, Desiree Dewey as well, um, who's impacted the first team less, but he's he's got a bright future ahead of him. So considering the amount of money that, that PSG have spent on previous summers on what you would call quote unquote marquee signings, which are guys sometimes just coming in to take a check. And I'm looking at you, Sergio Ramos. This looks like an actual project of building a team that, that can actually go and get closer to the Champions League again, like they did in the final against Bayern in, in 2020. So they've kind of ditched the, the Messi, um, Neymar, Mbappe superstar front line to build out a more young, rounded, aggressive pressing team. And the uh, It'll be interesting to watch this team grow together and then see how good they can really become because they, it's, it's certainly on paper it's a very exciting group of young players that they've got now. Yeah, the PSG project seems to be kind of different than the, the Galactico PSGs that we have seen in the past and that probably is the way to go for, for football teams because it did not work for PSG to sign all these superstars. We had the, the, the obviously the, the Messi and, and Neymar and Mbappe front, front line that didn't deliver them the Champions League so hopefully they, well, Hopefully for the fans that the, these new signings can entertain and succeed on the pitch. Yeah, you know, we just have to wait and see can they over or turn Monaco, but so far undefeated in the league. So yeah, it's off to a good start. 
Yeah, so no A's in our report cards for the big teams. We've got B's for PSG, Napoli, Juventus and Inter. Um, so we've got the Premier League getting La Liga and Bundesliga flailing in the background with their summer business. So far, we might add, but we must add that so far. A lot of these guys haven't really featured much so, so far for various reasons. Um, I'm very interested if, to highlight some of them. If you look at Lenny Euro, I think that was a good signing. Um, I think they paid too much for him. But I think once he gets in the United team, I think he will look really, really good. So I'm excited to see him come back. Um, and I think there's there's other cases of guys slotting in. I think Paulinho is a very good player. It's just whether he fits into the way that the company wants to play. So there are guys out there that aren't really featuring yet, which we know are good players. Douglas Louise has been another example of a very good player that um, that is a bit frozen out at the minute. And in three or four months' time, if he's playing regularly, then, then those kind of gradings might look different for those teams. So we have to wait and see. Yeah, something we can probably revisit in, in January or February after the January transfer market and see see how the teams as a whole do. But January transfer window, if, if Lassana Diara had his way, might might look very different. Uh, I know that's something you've been keeping a, a close eye on, and it is something that maybe many of our of our listeners have heard about, but aren't necessarily clear on the ramifications of the the court case that he he brought against FIFA and. I know FIFA have come out after it and their legal compliance officer said that they look forward to developing the regulatory framework further and all this sort of waffle and they see it as a chance to modernise the regulatory framework and they're using all these sort of puffy language. But for the, the everyman out there, what, what does this actually mean for transfers going forward or what do you think will happen, Paul? Right. I, I mean, the actual case itself is quite complex, so I would advise people to just to go and read up on it. But the long and the short of it is that um, Lasana Diara was sued by Locomotive Moscow for, for breach of contract for refusing to train um, after he'd been left out of the side and, and Locomotive Moscow threatened to reduce his salary. So the Locomotive basically sued Diara for the size of his transfer fee from when he signed for them from Angie uh, uh, a couple of years prior. Diara argued that the fee that Locomotive paid um, to, to Angie he had no bearing on that whatsoever. That was a transaction between two clubs and wasn't reflective of what a value that he believed he was worth or what a market value was. Um, and, and in addition, because this case was still ongoing, FIFA refused to grant Diara his ITC, which is in his international transfer certificate, which would have allowed him to sign for Charleroi at the time. Charleroi did not want to enter into this agreement with Diara simply because they feared that if they found uh, if they signed Diara and FIFA again found in, in, in the case of Locomotive, they would have to fight, pay, pay, the, pay the fee as, as a fine. So they were reluctant to get involved in it. Now, all of this messiness comes together to, um, to coalesce in the idea that Diara was basically denied the ability to work because of FIFA's regulations around the International Transfer Certificate and also the punitive measures put in place for um, supposed breach of contract at a club. And... Diara and his lawyers have argued that this is in contravention of, of EU law and have requested, uh, had requested a hearing for it. So the hearing was two weeks ago. Both sides uh, in the hearing, and, and on one side we have Diara and his lawyers, and we also have FIFPRO, who are the, uh, the player representatives. They all believe that this was a massive victory for Diara and for um, the corruption of the, the transfer market as it currently stands, and they believed that the full system would have to be ripped up and start again. FIFA's response was that they had saw it as a victory for their entire way of their system working and believed that they would only have to amend one or two paragraphs of their current statutes in order to meet the regulations um, of the final decision. Now, what, where we are right now is that the court has decided that, this, that there has to be some amendments to the way that FIFA operates, but there's not an official complete decision yet. So we're not exactly entirely sure what the recommendations will be. FIFA seem confident that they can get through it by reforming and evolving the system rather than a complete revolution of the transfer system. I think some people feared that the concept of the transfer market and indeed contracts in general might be blown up by this because if a player was able to walk out of a contract at any time, then the the, the purpose of that contract would cease to be relevant and it cease to exist. So that would mean that players would, wouldn't be able to go for transfer fees because why would you pay a fee for a player if he can walk out the door tomorrow? I don't think at this point it's going to be as extreme as that, but there are going to be fundamental changes to the way that the transfer market works 
and how deep FIFA have to go with this will really depend on the final judgment. But as you mentioned, and, and I would to their Ronan, they are already starting to put out a bit of rhetoric that they're going to consult with key stakeholders in order to make the right changes. And that's a bit different and a bit evolved from what they said immediately after the judgment, which in that case, you kind of got the idea that they thought they can make one or two changes to the wording and get out of this. Whereas I think that they've kind of stepped back now and thought, well, actually, we need to do a lot more to kind of revolutionise how the transfer market works here and make it properly comply with EU law. So where we are right now is, I don't know, <laughs> but FIFA doesn't know either and won't know until the final judgment comes out. And it will be interesting to see which stakeholders they wish to speak to, whether that be the players, the clubs, the organisations, or everybody together to try and find a, a way of, of this working in a way that's more compliant with law. But also, I think FIFA would be very wary of giving over complete control to players and allowing them to, to kind of walk out on contracts or leave contracts early for any reason because that's the function of the market. And, and, and in fairness to FIFA, I do think that the court decision made that clear that there is a belief that FIFA have to be the overarching entity which decides this stuff and makes the final decision. Um, and it's only in the, kind of, the weeds of how employment contract works where they have to kind of iron stuff out here. So the fact that they are willing to consult on it suggests that there will be changes, but how big these changes will prove to be, we won't really know until the final decision comes, which I think is, is next year, I believe. And also once FIFA has finished its consultation with its members, to decide what to do next. So it could be something or it could be completely nothing. But the likelihood is it will be a little bit of something in between which might change how the transfer market operates, but not in a way which would destroy footballtransfers.com overnight, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think even if it did change to the, the worst case scenario, like you, you, you said there, the players could walk out on their contract that would probably give us more stuff to write about rather than less stuff to write about. So, yeah, I, think I think it's important just to add on that, Ronan, that Contracts are a two-way thing, right? Um, yes, players can. If players had the freedom to walk out in contracts, it would mean that players would uh, clubs rather would be disincentivised from spending transfer fees. But for quite a lot of players out there, having a contract is a pretty good thing. Um, if I if, if Bayern Munich could spend no money on Paulinha, right, and then can just let him walk away tomorrow, and he's not getting paid, that's not a very good deal for Paulinha, right? I think he's happy to sit there and collect his four-year contract with with the money that's guaranteed no matter what he does on the pitch, and also no matter what happens to him physically. Um, he could get injured at any point. So the contracts do work at the moment for players as well and protects them in certain scenarios where if they're out of form or, or suffer a serious injury, they're looked after and they still get paid. So I don't think it's in the players' interest to completely blow up a transfer system, which could mean they could move three or four times a season. Um, I don't think that would happen. I don't think the players would want that. And it would only really benefit, I don't know, the top 10 or 15 players in the world to, over, in, in, in a in a system which is over half a million players in it. Um, maybe Haaland would want to go and play for a different team in the Premier League every month. That may actually be quite cool. But I think most other players would be happy and more content to retain the, 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 the salaries that they get on the longer term contracts that they get, which guarantees them certain amounts of income. Um, yeah, and that's something that's important to bear in mind. Especially with the, to the lower players, the, the players that are b beneath Haaland. And like you said, when you were talking about Fief Pro are one of the kind of key people in this this legal battle they they obviously want what's best for the players and maybe extortionate transfer fees aren't best for the players but being able to have a secure contract a secure place of work knowing that like you said if someone was to suffer a career ending injury there is that kind of guarantee that comes with a long term contract that you're not going to be just shelled out or put out on the street and ignored about so there is kind of an interest or a vested interest from the players to to continue having some sort of a transfer system. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens. But like you said, if the, the judgment isn't until next year sometime, we probably won't see any effects of it in the in the intermediate kind of period. So the January transfer window should continue as normal. And no, no, no it's, it'll be... FIFA, FIFA will, um, even if, even if the, the judgment finds a more extreme version or position that I think it will, FIFA would appeal it, then appeal it, and then appeal it again. You're talking years years and years before we would see any market changes to how the market works here. Um, it's not going to be a Bosman-style situation which pretty much changed the, the landscape overnight. I, I don't think it's going to be anything like that, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on. And the, and the last thing to add is, we, we discussed this in the previous pod, general spending is down. Like Even the Saudis spent a lot less money this summer 
clubs are, are, are just more wary of risk around big transfers than ever before. And as we've discussed in multiple times, if you look down the list of the record transfers that took place uh, in the history of football, there's not a lot of slam dunk successes there, really. Um, and I think clubs are wary of that now, and I think they're more likely to scout around and, and find players that are flying under the radar a little bit more than spending that 100, 150 million. I just don't see that happening again anytime soon. Um, I think clubs would rather take, take one or two bites at the cherry at a lower level of expense. Um, so I don't think this is the case of the transfer market running away from football. I think spending is actually coming back towards um, the, the teams. Um, but obviously, contractually, what would, this will really that could impact how long contracts are, how, how much players get paid for those contracts. All of these things are, are decisions that need to be made once we find out the, the final judgment. Yeah, so you'll have to keep listening to uh, the Transfers podcast for the next four years to be keep, kept up to date on, <laughs> on every kind of back and forth between between the players and, uh, and FIFA to, to, uh, so, to know exactly what's happening and how the transfer market is changing. Thanks very much, Paul. You've been listening to the Transfers podcast powered by footballtransfers.com. If you liked what you heard, please follow us on your favourite podcast platform and give us a rating or a review. Your support helps build a bigger audience and bring you more news, analysis and insight. You can also follow our messages on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube at Transfers Podcast. Our tri- Twitter address is at Transfers Podcast. Paul is at Paul FC and I'm at Swear Not Paul on Twitter. Our production is by Mark Caulfield of Pro Podcast Production and our music by Mark Caulfield and David L. Stay safe, be well and thank you for listening. Go.